really grateful that I um, have the opportunity to share some of the insights that I've gleaned around nutrition in thalassemia. And as Rowana said, um, you know, uh, there is a need um, and there's, there's so much that, you know, that needs to happen. And, and hopefully these sessions um, last, you know, the first one today and then the following two sessions will at least provide some sort of guidance and insight into how and steps you can take to improve um, your nutritional status living with thalassemia. Um, so I will start the pre presentation by saying that there will be people on the call today um, that may know quite a lot already about nutrition in thalassemia and 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 but hopefully through the presentation you may be able to learn something new or get a refresher um, and for those of you who know a little maybe there's something we can add to what you already know and and if you don't know a lot then that's perfectly fine because hopefully again through the session um, you know you'll be able to add to what you know and and be able to sort of go away with with some meaningful information and advice and guidance that you can go and apply um, to um, you know to, to improving your nutritional state is a nutritional health in thalassemia. So as um, Stuart said, I am Dr. Claudine Matthews. So I am a dietitian by background. Um, I currently work in a GP practice in a primary care network, so five GP practices. Um, and I have not too long ago, as I said in the first session, finished my doctorate um, in sickle cell and um, nutrition um, and have founded my nonprofit organization, Sickle Cell Nutrition Academy, which is the logo that you see there. But please know today is all about you. It's all about nutrition in thalassemia. Um, and as I said, you know, hopefully I can add to what you already know and hopefully I can learn as well from you. So thank you again to the Red Cell Network and to the Thalassemia Society, the UK Thalassemia Society for inviting me. Um, and I hope you enjoy the session. So it's a full session, um, so three parts, just to be clear, um, for those of you who haven't received the, the, the slide about this earlier on. Um, so the first part will be a re sort of a recap of session one, just picking up on the main points um, around iron overloading, because we know that iron overloading underpins a lot of the clinical features and the nutritional problems related to patients living with thalassemia. Um, I'll be answering some of the outstanding questions in relation to that, but also end up with a bit of a summary of the main nutrients that we touched on in um, in session one, because you will find as we go through that that information will underpin a lot of the advice and the tips and the guidance, um, you know, in relation to the endocrine problems that we will cover today. So part two will be the bulk of the session this evening, and that will focus on diet and nutrition and endocrine problems. It's very important for me to also highlight the clinical features because we have better understanding um, of the nutritional management when we understand what's, what the clinical features are. So I'll, I will do a combination of both, but hopefully, obviously, focus on the nutritional side of things as well. So we'll cover pancreatic insufficiency, diabetes, hypothyroidism, hypo can never say this, hypogonadism, um, and sort of, as I said, touch on the clinical features, nutritional problems, and then I'll end off with, there's about two or three questions that was asked in the last session, and I'll answer that as well. And then the last session, part three, will be, again, just lifestyle and empowerment, so helpful tips that you can take along and, um, and give you a chance to set some goals, you know, take away from the learning from this evening and set some goals, you know, so that you can take a moving forward, um, and, and hopefully you know, um, you know, really be able to benefit from the the, the investment of your time um, this evening session. So last time I started with a background um, for those of you who didn't join the session one, just a little bit of background about me. So I was born in Cape Town in South Africa 21 years ago. That makes me 21 and I love that. Um, <laughs> Um, no, maybe not. But anyway, so experienced racism and marginalization growing up under the apartheid regime. Um, I was qualified as a dietitian in, the, in, in South Africa, but moved to the UK in 2000. I was introduced to sickle cell and thalassemia in 2011 uh, and 2012, worked as a social liaison officer for, for both sickle cell and thalassemia patients um, in East London. Um, and it's only in 2014 that I became aware of nutrition in sickle cell and thalassemia. 
What I will say at this point is that whenever I heard of thalassemia, I would always hear of nutrition being spoken about, but in sickle cell that didn't happen. And so that's why I was more focused on looking at what happens in sickle cell um, because there was just nothing being said about nutrition. So I started my doctorate in 2016, um, had my own fair share of challenges health-wise and also related to the studies, but thankfully completed the studies um, in December of last year. So really happy to be on this side of, of that. So again, just to give you an overview of the education session. So we had session one that was all about iron overloading um, and, and, and the, the, the nutritional problems related to that. So in terms of anemia, malnutrition and growth failure. Today, as, as I already mentioned, is all about endocrine problems, diabetes, pancreatic insufficiency, hormonal um, imbalances. And then session three, which is the 17th of April, so just after Easter, we'll be focusing on bone health, osteoporosis and immunity. And I'll do a bit on the, the minerals, a little bit more detail on the minerals during that session as well. So don't miss that one. And then the fourth session will be the 1st of May. And we'll look at the major organs um, and the gastrointestinal tract. And I've got an idea of what I want to do for session four, which I need to speak to Stuart about. So watch the space. So put that date in the diary. You may have a nice surprise when you get to that point. So moving on very swiftly, then we'll start with part one, which is the recap of session one. As I said, we'll look at very briefly the problems related to iron overloading, answer your questions, and then the summary of the nutrients. So as I started the session one, I looked at diet and nutrition in thalassemia. And as I said, it's very important for you to understand what the clinical features are thalassemia is and, and so that you can understand what the nutritional uh, problems are related to that. And so we know that with, with thalassemia, there's any ineffective erythropoiesis, some big words, but the erythropoiesis just relates to the process of making red blood cells. So that process doesn't work as well when you live with thalassemia. And there's also chronic hemolysis, so that's the rapid breakdown of red blood cells resulting in the se severe anemia that you, that you can experience and, and the hypercoagulability as well. Um, a primary problem um, related to the treatment of thalassemia is iron overloading. And, and you will know, living with uh, thalassemia, that that is something that you hear all the time. Um, and... Um, and then the other uh, in clinical feature that that's highlighted predominantly um, is the fact that the, the formation of blood cell components called hematopoiesis, that happens outside of the bone marrow for, for patients as well, the extramedullary hematopoiesis, and that can also result in a, in, in a number of problems for patients. So you will know, because you, you know many of you will live with thalassemia, the two main types, um, beta thalassemia major, also known as transfusion dependent and also thalassemia intermediate, known as a non-transfusion dependent. Although some of these patients, depending on the severity of their morbidity, may also require regular transfusions. So when we're looking at the nutrition implications, and this is literally just a summary of the focus points of the four sessions. So we've done iron overloading, we're looking at endocrine problems tonight, bone health and immunity, and also the major organ um, uh, problems with with the major organs um, and and the gastrointestinal tract, which which we'll cover in the following sessions. So this is stock again. There you go. So just briefly again, looking at the impact. Uh, why is iron overloading such a problem, and the impact of that? So some of the clinical effects of iron overloading is the buildup of iron in vital organs such as the liver, heart, and the endocrine glands, which is the focus for tonight. But it's also um, side effects um, in relation to the chelation treatment uh, used to, tr to, to treat the iron overloading. And so we know as well that there's a wide range of nutritional implications um, related to the treatment of thalassemia and thalassemia as, as, the, as a condition uh, itself. So coming to the nutrition effects, uh, there is a multifactorial etiology of the nutrition effects um, and the nutritional adequacy, inadequacy in thalassemia. And this is related to, and I want you to pay attention to this because this again, you know, is, is really important to understand why, you know, you would you may be experiencing nutritional problems. So it could be related to poor nut nutrient intake. So you have a poor appetite. There may be cultural preferences, um, a decreased nutrient density, um, losses in the GI tract. Um, that, that may be uh, a reason why 
there's nutritional inadequacy, there may be increased nutrient requirements because of this red cell turnover, because of the fact that your red blood cells break really quickly or, or um, that chronic hemolysis, and also something called oxidative stress, which is almost a side effect of this red cell turnover. And that is essential, essentially just um, the ab, um, um, imbalance of, um, not imbalance, the, um, uh, 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 oh gosh, um, the raised amount of harmful substances that you find in the blood vessels that can actually cause damage to the cell, to the cell wall. So oxidative stress is, is a big problem um, as well. And then increased nutrient loss and sequestration. So you can see there's a range of um, sort of multifactorial factors that can result in nutritional inadequacy. So growth failure is, is a big problem. Um, again, it's multifactorial. It is related to malnutrition um, and to a range of nutrient deficiencies, which we'll cover as well. It's related to the severity of your level of anemia. Um, and this is the availability or the lack of availability of enough oxygen to tissues, cells and organs. Um, when you do suffer from growth failure, it does mean that it affects your ability, your normal growth and development. Um, that can affect your energy levels, can affect how active you are, you know, being able to do the normal activities of daily living, but also can have an impact on the quality of life that you lead um, if the symptoms of your thalassemia is not treated promptly. So there's a number of nutritional and clinical considerations um, to, to take to, to, to consider when we're looking at growth failure. And one of the first ones, and certainly in relation to the pediatric patient group, is a, a, a recommendation that the patients um, be seen and assessed um, every six months in pediatric clinic, um, just to stay on top of things and not allow things to get out of hand, um, you know, with you know, because because they're not being monitored regularly. And in addition to that, making sure that the anemia is corrected and also that the level of iron overload is being monitored, as well as the iron collation regime is, is being monitored. So in relation to the nutritional inadequacies, to ensure that there is enough for adequate calorie intake, so to having energy dense foods, having enough proteins, um, protein foods in your diet, having enough vitamins and minerals and some of the, the minerals and vitamins I've, I've noted there to be zinc. Um, I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Folic acid, vitamin D um, and vitamin A. And I've added on here as well, which they highlight in the literature. It's important for patients and families to be to be supported through this process um, in terms of psychological support, social support and emotional support, because it, it is quite an involved condition. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's beneficial for for you to if you're not already accessing that additional support that you do that um, in order to manage your condition. I included this slide again because this is this is a slide that just summarizes um, some of the um, the uh, recommendations around uh, nutrition um, in the context of iron overloading. Um, so if you are iron overloaded um, because you're on regular transfusion, um, and we also know that patients with non-transfusion dependent thalassemia may also develop iron overloading because of um, losses in the GI tract that's absorbed, um, you have to limit the amount of iron in your diet um, and also be compliant with the iron collation regime. Um, it's really important um, for you to do that. Um, so what can you include in your diet? So patients can have, you can have fruits and vegetables, you can have grains and legumes, eggs, lean protein sources like chicken and turkey, you can have dairy. Um, Tea and coffee taken with meals can also help to reduce the iron absorption, um, but also reducing the intake of foods that's rich in vitamin A and vitamin C because these foods do tend um, to enhance iron absorption. But also pay attention to uh, reducing your intake of foods that have been fortified with iron. So that means you have to read the label, particularly cereals and flour and things like that. So do read the label to see whether it's been fortified and then obviously avoiding supplements containing iron. So moving on to the healthy principles, and again, I've, I've included this because this information does form the basis for a lot of the nutritional sort of guidance that will be given throughout the sessions. Um, and this is just the summary of what we spoke about in, in the session one. 
and I've included the South Asian Eat Well Guide um, as an example this evening. But essentially, the Eat Well Guide is about the five food groups. Um, and so the orange group or the, the, the yellow group is your carbohydrates, your starchy foods, your breads, your cereals, potatoes, chapatis, rice, um, sweet potato, etc. Um, the green group is your fruits and vegetables. And you can see the, there's a wide variety of, of fruits and vegetables that you can uh, choose, um, you know, on a, uh, to eat um, from proteins, which is the pink group in, in the Eat Well Guide. So that, again, a range of your legumes, beans, pulses, meat, um, uh, meat uh, protein alternatives, fish, eggs, nuts. Um, so all of that forms part of that pink group or the protein foods. You've got the dairy group, which is the blue group. So that's milk and milk alternatives, um, soya milk, almond milk, if, 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 if you're not able to take um, sort of a lactose and then cheese and yogurt as well. And then the little slither, the purple group, there is your fats and oils. And we'll say a little bit more about that moving forward. But just to add as well, hydration to having enough water is really important. Um, and what they highlight on the Eat Well Guide as well is to reduce your intake of foods that are high in sugar and high in fat, because in those foods, apart from the calories and the energy you get from the fat and the sugar, it doesn't actually provide that, that nutrient density in terms of vitamins and minerals and proteins, and so to reduce that as well. So just the summary of the key nutrients for healthy living, um, going through those five food groups again. So carbohydrates, the best source of energy for the body in terms of the brain, the central nervous system, muscle digestion. The better cho choices would be your complex and unrefined carbohydrates, so whole, whole grains, fruits and vegetables, um, and going for the no added sugar options um, of food as well. The protein group, again, an important nutrient um, to maintain good health and vitality and also repair. Um, and um, and so and again, it's an important part of all tissues, bones, nerves, hair, skin, hormones. So it's really, really important. And if we don't take in enough protein, the body will start using. Sorry, if you don't take in enough carbohydrates, the body will start using protein for energy. So we do want to ensure that we're taking in enough carbohydrates or enough energy sources so that we can spare the protein to do its work in terms of growth and development. Vitamins, again, very important for growth, maintenance of health, prevention of disease, can't be made by the body, so you have to take it in your diet. So your five a day is really, really important in terms of vitamins and in terms of your minerals as well. So with the minerals, it's an important catalyst for biological processes. Again, you can see the muscle response, digestion, um, production of hormones, really important uh, functions within the body. We mentioned the importance of water. All of the major physiological processes are reliant on water, so we do need to take in enough of that and then fiber as well to help keep the digestive system healthy. So coming on to answering some of the outstanding questions related to the diet. So there was a question about the benefits of eating beetroot. And if you go through the list, you will see that um, it's a good source of fiber, and you said fiber is good, folate, manganese, potassium, but also iron and vitamin C. So if you do have iron overload, which the majority of people will have, then, then the advice would be to lay off having beetroot um, because that will enhance your the, the iron. And we definitely don't want to do that. But the benefits for those of you who do or are able to have it and enjoy beetroot is improved blood flow, lower blood pressure and increased ex exercise um, performance. There was another question related around the benefit of collagen in bone health. And the next session will focus a lot on bone health. But um, so again, just looking to the literature to look at the, the, the benefit. We know collagen is the biggest component of bone. Um, and um, and so lots of research has been been done, but there's no conclusive research to say that you have to have, um, you know, collagen as a supplement. Um, uh, if you if you are taking it or if you're thinking about taking it, then definitely discuss it with your medical team because you may need your levels monitored. Um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of research, but there's no conclusive sort of research to say that absolutely you, you have to take it as a supplement. 
Then there was another question around blood pressure. Someone's blood pressure was going low in the evening and they were asking about salty foods. Um, and there could be many possible causes of your blood pressure being low. It could be medical cause in relation to postural hypotension, balance in terms of your ears. It could be related to hydration, you know, your fluid status. And so my advice would be to definitely seek medical advice in the first instance. Good, so we got through that. So now we're coming on to the bulk in part two, which is the bulk of the presentation. So again, focusing on diet, nutrition and endocrine problems. Um, and let's begin. So yeah, we'll be focusing on diet nutrition, as I mentioned. So coming on to the endocrine problems, and again, we know, because I've said this before, that a lot of the problems associated with thalassemia comes as a side effect of iron overloading um, and ineffective iron collation. And certainly this is the case for endocrine problems. And so specifically, um, some of the endocrine problems is re in relation to pancreatic insufficiency, diabetes, type 1 and type 2, tinnital focus, and focus on type 2, because type 1 generally gets managed um, in a more specialist sort of setting. So I'll focus on type 1, um, hypothyroidism, hypogonadism. Um, and then in terms of nutritional implications, so in relation to those clinical features, there's a whole host of nutritional implications um, that, 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 that I will mention and that we will discuss going through. So it can lead to malabsorption of nutrients, particularly in regards to pancreatic insufficiency, impaired digestion, impaired blood glucose control, particularly in relation to diabetes, dyslipidemia, increased cardiovascular risk, there's home hormonal um, functioning as well in in in, re in regards to delayed pubertal uh, maturation. So, yeah, so there's a range of things and we'll go through that um, in a bit more detail moving forward. So we'll start off with pancreatic insufficiency. And again, I like to look at the clinical features first to give you context so that you, you can understand why why we needed to, to make those changes to the to the diet um, um, you know in relation to the clinical features. So looking at the pancreas, um, when they talk about the pancreas, they talk about the endocrine pancreas and an exocrine pancreas. And the endocrine pancreas basically produces the insulin. Um, and insulin is a hormone that helps to control blood sugar levels. And we'll say a little bit more later on about that as well. The exocrine pancreas produces and releases enzymes necessary for digestion. And in particular, in, in, um, the, in relation to digestion, are these three um, enzymes, amylase, which is needed for carbohydrate digestion, proteases needed for protein digestion, and lipase needed for fat digestion. So if we link that, moving that to the nutritional problems then, um, so again, we know that it's related to the buildup of iron in the endocrine gland, which affects its function. Um, and some of the function could be the insulin sensitivity that's been affected, and this can affect the blood glucose control, um, but also it does not produce enough of the enzymes essential for digestion, which I've just mentioned in terms of the amylase, proteases, etc. And when this happens, then that can actually lead to increased risk of malnutrition for patients, malabsorption of uh, really new, uh, key nutrients, and this can cumulatively lead to poor nutritional status for patients. So what's the medical management um, for pancreatic insufficiency? Um, and for many patients who do have uh, severe pancreatic insufficiency, they have to take um, creone. Um, and essentially what creon is, it replaces the enzymes that your pancreas is not releasing. So the lipases and the amylase um, and the proteases that I mentioned in the previous slide. And so the creon, um, the enzymes that's in the creon will actually help your body to digest the fats, the proteins and the carbohydrates. And so it's important that you take your creon with every meal and snack. Um, it's important to be compliant with that because as 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 you've heard me say before, that the creon contains the enzymes to help break down your food. So if you're eating, but you're not taking the creon and your body isn't producing these enzymes, then you the, the food will just pass through the body um, and it will res result in malabsorption and that will affect um, your nutrition risk as well. So looking at the nutritional management, so the, the um, suggestion recommendation is for you to, to have low fat dairy sources, to choose healthier fats, 
So to look at more monosaturated and poly polyunsaturated fats, omega-3 fats are more of the healthier ones. To have a high protein diet, but to go for the lean protein sources because you want to reduce the overall amount of fat that you take in your diet um, because that that will be affected by the reduced um, amount of lipase, you know, that's released from the pancreas. And then to have nutrient dense foods. So ensuring that you're getting a good, uh, you know, choosing foods that will give you the vitamins, that will give you the minerals, that will give you the protein um, that, that you need, you know, to promote good health. There is a caution, so uh, uh, in terms of avoiding fiber-rich foods um, and alcohol, because fiber uh, apparently can help, actually can um, reduce the effect of the, the enzymes. So you don't want to, if you are having to take um, Creon or because if you're suffering from pancreatic insufficiency, that you take some fiber, but not too much in the diet um, and also reduce the, the alcohol intake because that has the same effect. Um, but certainly not to have large meals because, again, you know, the body, you have to take the creon, which is sort of artificial um, enzymes that you're taking. And, you know, you don't want to overload the pancreas already. That's, you know, already sort of suffering because there's a lot of iron sort of build up in there. So you want to have sort of um, regular sized meals so that, you know, the, the, the pancreas and the body is able to digest it um, in a more efficient way. So I've added a few slides that I've touched on last time, but malnutrition keeps coming up, you know, in the context. And as we've just heard there in terms of the fact that there's reduced um, enzyme um, secretion, you know, in, in pancreatic um, uh, insufficiency. And so malnutrition is a real problem for, for patients. And so just to be aware again that if you are suffering from malnutrition, thinking, being aware of the causes. So you know, not taking in enough protein in the diet, not taking in enough energy foods, so your starchy, your carbohydrate foods, your, your healthy fats, and then your micronutrients, your vitamins and your minerals. Some patients might have a reduced appetite and therefore not take in enough, you know, to maintain a, a healthy weight and a nutritional status, and this can lead to weight loss, um, and which which can exacerbate your, your malnutrition risk um, or even exacerbate the malnutrition that you're already experiencing. So usually we would recommend um, food first. Uh, so, you know, fortifying your food. So when I say fortify, you're adding in extra. So you're adding in things like cheese, adding in things like um, margarine, um, you know, and, it, it you know, again, when I say these things, it's always helpful to um, if you are able to speak to a dietitian or a nutritionist to sort of give you guidance. But 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 the whole aim of this is to almost make every mouthful count by adding in extras so that you can get in that extra protein, get in that extra nutrients to prevent the weight loss, um, you know, that, that, that you potentially might be experiencing. So choosing energy dense foods and the suggestion recommendation is that you have little and often and it's probably a good idea if you have pancreatic, insuff uh, pancreatic insufficiency as I said because then it doesn't overload the pancreas in terms of the volume of enzymes that needs to be released to try and digest the, the, the food. If the food, food first advice doesn't quite work, then you can um, ask the GP to prescribe you nutritional supplements. You do need a nutritional assessment for this, as I mentioned before, but you can get some over-the-counter ones that you can make up with milk um, and, and, and hopefully that can add to the food fortification, you know, um, and again, reduce your risk or improve your malnutrition risk um, over time. Another slide I shared last time, but again, it's useful because this this will be a recurrent theme throughout. Um, so again, just suggestions and and of of how you can fortify and what you can fortify. So you can fortify your drinks, you can fortify the uh, yogurt, soups, porridge, cereals, um, and and as a way of adding in extra protein, as a way of adding in extra calories, so that you can prevent um, weight loss that can you know worsen your malnutrition risk. So now we're coming on to, we've just concluded the pancreatic insufficiency. Hopefully you got some tips there. We'll move on to pre to pre-diabetes. So essentially pre-diabetes is the intermediate state before, um, you know, you go on to develop diabetes, but we don't want to go on to develop diabetes if, if we can. Um, and, and obviously if you do have, if you, you know, um, diagnosed with pre-diabetes, you do have a higher risk 
of developing diabetes, um, but there's things that you can do to hopefully try and prevent that from happening. But essentially with prediabetes is there is a presence of blood glucose levels that's slightly above the normal, not quite sort of the diabetes threshold, but it is above the normal. And you can see in brackets, there's 5.6 5 to 7 millimoles. So normal blood glucose control is between 4 and 7. That's the normal blood glucose control. And if you've had a glucose tolerance test, again, if your reading is between 7.9 to 11 millimoles per litre, then um, you fall into that, that bracket of, of being pre-diabetic. So what can you do to prevent pre-diabetes in the first instance. Follow a healthy diet. You'll hear this quite a lot throughout the, the talk. You know, um, a, sorry, follow a healthy lifestyle by eating a good diet. Physical activity is really, really important as well. If you are smoking, then please, the recommendation is to stop smoking and there are services in GP practices that can help you do that. If you do suffer from hypertension or high blood pressure, then if you are on medication, do take your medication regularly, um, but but also just sort of try and, and keep your blood pressure as, as within the normal range as, as possible. Achieve and maintain a healthy weight. If you're slightly over the your BMI, a healthy BMI, um, you know, take action in terms of um, getting back within the normal sort of healthy BMI. And, and that's about 23 for people from black and ethnic minority groups. Um, for Caucasians is um, a upper limit of 25. And then dyslipidemia, so correcting sort of the abnormal sort of lipids in the blood. So diabetes. So if you, ha you have prediabetes and, you know, and for some reason you've gone on to develop diabetes, um, let's look at what that is. So what is diabetes? It's a disorder of carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolism. And it means that the body is not able to control the blood sugar levels after digesting carbohydrate foods. So essentially all carbohydrate foods, and there is a slide that that I will show you later on that gives you an idea of the range of carbohydrate foods. But all di uh, uh, carbohydrate foods, when it's digested, will be broken down into sugar. That's released into the bloodstream. And this will trigger the pancreas to release insulin. But if you have diabetes, it may mean that uh, you, you're, you don't have enough insulin available or it means that the insulin that you do have available doesn't work as well, or can be a combination of, of the two. And this is a common complication that's found in patients, um, 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 transfusion-dependent um, thalassemic patients. Um, and this results in raised blood glucose levels, also known as hyperglycemia. So what's the cause and the types and the risks? So iron overload. <laughs> Um, is the cause of the destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. So, so the islets of Langerhans, Langerhans is the, 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 the cell that actually releases the, the insulin in the pancreas. Um, and if there's destruction of this, and obviously then that will affect your blood glucose control. There may be, um, for some people as well, uh, um, an uh, impact on autoimmunity and autoimmune uh, reason for, for the diabetes. And it may also be uh, as a consequence of... Um, insulin resistance secondary to liver disease, because we know that iron, you know, can build up in the liver as well. Um, the consequence of that is diabetes. So as I mentioned, two main types, type one and type two. So type one essentially is where your body does not produce um, enough uh, of the insulin and and um, you do need to then have insulin injections to manage your diabetes with type 2. Um, usually it can be you start off with diet and then you go on to medication and then you, you, you can go on to injections as well. And um, so those are the two main um, types of diabetes. And so for patients um, at risk of diabetes, um, it's important that the glucose dysregulation is highlighted um, and, and recognized as a problem and diagnosed early so that the treatment can start early. Because again, if you don't um, uh, maintain a good blood glucose control, that can also result in a number of uh, complications. So the management of diabetes, um, usually for non-thalassemic patients, um, there's a blood test called the HbA1c test. Um, that is done um, and it gives you like a three month sort of average reading of your blood glucose control. But because we have um, this chronic hemolysis, this rapid breakdown of red blood cells, 
the test that's used for diabetic patients, for thalassemic diabetic patients, as, as well as sickle cell, is called fructus amine. And essentially, this test reflects the two to three week blood glucose control. Um, and so if you do have diabetes um, and you are checking your, your levels, maybe your finger prick before your meals, that sh reading should be around 7.2 millimoles per litre. And if you're doing it after your meals, two hours or postprandial, that shouldn't be more than 10 millimoles per litre. And so in terms of the goals for management, um, so looking at the, indi you know, individualizing it to the patient in terms of the age, life expectancy, living conditions, your ability to understand hyperglycemia and also the existence of other sort of problems such as cardiovascular disease. So if you're an adult with diabetes, um, as I said, particularly type 2 diabetes, um, you do have an increased risk of developing athlete these words, atherosclerosis, <laughs> and this is just the buildup of fatty plaques within the blood vessels, um, and also um, microvascular complications. Remember, I said if you're not able to control your blood sugar levels within that normal range, then there are some complications associated with that. And so, it's important for patients that to control their blood pressure um, and also their lipids. Um, if you're smoking, please stop smoking um, if you can and get the support that you need, but also control your cholesterol levels, um, particularly aiming for a higher HDL. So if you have a low HDL, which is the the, the, the good cholesterol, um, high density lipoprotein, um, you know, you want to take action again to 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 um, reduce the overall cholesterol, but increase your good cholesterol level. And there's a slide later on with a bit more detail. Lifestyle factors again, um, you know, diet and exercise is really, really important. Regular monitoring of your levels to see how good your control is with the fructose amine test in terms of is the blood test that you can do through your GP or your 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 medical team. Um, lifestyle changes, smoking, um, uh, cardiovascular risk, but also self monitoring um, is is helpful and and uh, recommended. So what's the medical management uh, in terms of pharmaceutical sort of side of things? Um, tablets. Um, many patients will start off with tablets. Um, metformin is, is one of the, the ones that people start off with. Um, but again, you can, depending on your level of control um, or the, the, the severity of the diabetes, you, you may also need to go on to insulin injections. Um, and as I said, the blood test there is the fructose amine test. So in terms of nutritional management, you can see there's a long list, um, you know, to, to of 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 um, actions to take in terms of the diet, but specifically aimed at improving your blood glucose control. Because as I said, if if you do don't control your blood glucose control, that can have other complications as well, and and we want to reduce that that risk of the the complications as much as we possibly can. So diet and exercise, you've heard that me say that a couple of times diet and exercise I'll say it again so having small regular meals spread throughout the day because again you know with re with regards to glucose control it is in relation to the insulin that's released by the pancreas and if your pancreas is damaged because of iron overloading you want to not um, overwork your your your, your pancreas um, and also you want to allow the insulin that is available to work as effectively so small regular meals throughout, spread throughout the day is suggested Going with high fiber starchy foods, so again, whole meal bread, cereals, beans, uh, lentils, um, fruits and vegetables daily, um, monitoring your carbohydrate intake. And this is, there's a slide that I'll go through very briefly with you. Paying attention to the type of fat that you're having in your diet, so going for more of a healthier type of fat, mono and saturated fats, olive oil, rapeseed oil, having fewer fried foods and cut of visible fats of meat, um, going for leaner sort of meat in terms of chicken and turkey, removing the skin as well. If you do need to have sugar, um, having a small amount of artificial sweetness or reducing the intake of honey, sugar, glucose, fructose that can definitely have a, a, you know, can increase your blood glucose levels. Avoiding large portions of starchy carbohydrates, as I've mentioned already, avoid large portions of saturated fats. 
um, because I've already said in the previous risk that there is an increased risk of ca cardiovascular disease for patients with diabetes. So you want to reduce that risk as well. So reducing the amount of butter, lard, ghee, red palm oil, pastries, crisps, etc., that that you may take in your diet. Avoiding too much salt. So going more with your spices, with peppers, herbs, garlic, etc. Um, and then if you are taking alcohol, stay within the limit of 14 units um, per, per week. I borrowed this slide from the Healthy Food Guide uh, website, and this is quite a helpful slide just to show you how you can divide your, your, your plate. Um, so if you used your dinner plate, uh, as shown in this, this uh, diagram here, um, and you divide it in two, so the one half is all about your non-starchy, colorful veg, as you can see in the example there. And the other half you divide into two. So two quarters for so the first quarter, you'll have carbohydrate foods, so potatoes, rice, pasta, uh, chapati. Um, and then the other quarter is your protein. And this, this will definitely help in terms of sort of uh, portion control, but also in terms of not overloading um, your, your, your body in terms of t your amount of carbohydrates that can increase, um, you know, and play havoc with your glycemic control as well. So I mentioned about different types of carbohydrates. So there's four groups. The first group is the low carbohydrates, and that slide said going for low, lower carbohydrate options, um, and those is mostly your, your vegetables. Um, can you see that your root vegetables, your potatoes, um, your yams, cassavas, um, sweet potato, it's starchy carbohydrate, so that, that has a higher total carbohydrate content. You also have your natural sugars, which is your fruits. And then you have a fourth group, which is your added or free sugars. And that's your cakes, sweets and fizzy drinks. And all the way through, I've been talking about nutrient dense food. So we want to almost avoid the foods from that fourth group there, the added free sugars, because again, what you're getting there mostly is sugar, um, um, energy from sugar rather than from the vitamins and minerals that you will get in the other three groups. So this slide I had in last time, just to highlight, it's important to go with the whole grains because whole grain options will help you feel fuller for longer, but also it's broken down and digested in a lot, lot, lot slower pace than if you were to go with maybe white rice or, or, or white pasta. Uh, and so the, the recommendation is to go for whole grain options. And then again, cutting down on sugar. I mentioned that free sugar group. Um, so staying within the recommendations, but again, if you have diabetes, then you do want to limit the free sugars um, because that can definitely have an impact on your overall glycemic or blood glucose control. So I've added the slide about the glycemic index just for, for your information as well. And the, it's it's in, in relation to glycemic or blood glucose control. Um, and so certain foods... Um, can uh, can uh, increase the blood glucose level, uh, um, you know, qu quite quite rapidly. Um, and so, essentially, what the, gl the glycemic control is about is 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 pa paying attention to how much of food raises the blood glucose level. So, high blood gl sugar levels or glucose levels can trigger the pancreas to release insulin, which I've already mentioned. But if you're taking in a lot of these foods on an ongoing basis, as I said, with a damaged uh, pancreas, then that can definitely overwork and, and you know, the, the, the pancreas. And so we want to sort of reduce and limit that over stimulation, so to speak, um, which is the next point. So high glycemic foods can overstimulate and exhaust the pancreas, which we don't want to do. Um, increased blood insulin is associated with heart disease and hypertension, which I've mentioned in previous slides. And so we do want to go with um, food options that have a higher sort of fiber content because this helps to slowly break down the carbohydrates and therefore decrease um, the enzyme action and also helps with the gradual release of the sugar. Instead of spiking, there's a gradual increase of the blood sugar levels. So in terms of the glycemic uh, group, so there's three, there's a low glycemic food group and there's, you see the examples there, kidney beans, chickpeas, lentils, again, to do with fiber, um, red, um, sorry, green vegetables, raw um, carrots, and this, is help, this will help you to regulate your blood sugar levels. The medium GI foods, sweet corn, bananas, raw pineapple, um, oat breakfast cereals, multigrain um, and rye bread. Then you also have that high GI group, which is your white rice, 
white bread, potatoes, etc. And um, we want to obviously have more of the low glycemic foods as much as possible. So that concludes the diabetes side. So now we're going to move on to the hypothyroidism. Um, and again, for me, it's really important to look at the no, the function of the, the the normal function of the thyroid gland because that will that will help you to understand sort of you know the 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 the, the, the clinical effects of hypothyroidism. So look, looking at what are the normal functions of the thyroid gland, it produces hormones. It regulates the body's metabolic rate, can induce lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fats or liposynthesis, the, the synthesis or, or building of, of, of fats. It can affect growth and development in children. And we know that with thalassemic, uh, the thalassemia, that is a, an ongoing problem. Um, it plays a role in controlling the heart muscle, digestive function, um, stimulates the metabolism of carbohydrates, anabolism of proteins, brain development can affect the mood in adults, bone maintenance, and we know that, you know, within thalassemia, the bone um, health is a problem, and also depends on a good supply of iodine from the diet. Um, so again, having salt that, um, that has um, iodine in it, seafood, seaweed, and vegetables. Um, for some patients uh, as well, it can um, lower levels can affect um, the memory and sleepiness. So looking at the causes or the consequences of hypothyroid, and hypo means low. Um, and so the causes of that um, is, again, in relation to iron toxicity because of iron overload, and that impacts the, the retardation of metabolic processes. Um, and again, it's affected by the level of iron chelation and iron chelation treatment. So it is important that you do sort of um, comply with, with that as much as possible. They do have a clinical a number of clinical stages, but it's important um, to highlight that children or that the, that screening for hypothyroidism happens no later than nine years old in, in, in children. Um, and as I've mentioned, with hypothyroidism, um, it does have an impact on the metabolic processes and how that 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 works, but also on dyslipidemia, which is the sort of um, the fat, abnormal fat in the blood. Um, and this may lead to serious cardiovascular disease. And so I do have a slide that touches on that a little bit um, in a bit more detail. So carrying on with hypothyroidism, um, what are the consequences? So the consequence of, of overt hypothyroidism is associated with, and here you have to pay attention, and this, this is in relation to that increased cardiovascular risk. It is um, uh, associated with an increase in total cholesterol, and we know that if the cholesterol is high in the blood, that can, um, you know, increase your cardiovascular risk um, and can, you know, contribute to the um, building of fatty plaques within the blood vessel. So we don't want that. We want to also um, the reduce the low density um, lipoprotein. So LDL is actually the bad cholesterol. So in hypothyroidism, you have this increase in total cholesterol, but also this increase in the bad cholesterol, this, this LDL. There's an increase in triglycerides, which is another type of fat, um, and also a variant of LDL called lipoprotein A. So you can see there that there's a number of risk factors, you know, for patients having an increased cardiovascular risk associated with hypothyroidism. Um, and also there's an increase of homocysteine and Again, this adds to that whole uh, picture of the increased um, ather atherosclerosis and also this increased cardiovascular risk. So potentially hypothyroidism has, you know, the, the consequences of that is quite significant for patients. So looking in terms of clinical and nutritional consequences of hypothyroidism, um, so in relation to the parathyroid, so you the thyroid has the two sort of glands alongside that called the parathyroid. Um, and um, so this can, the, um, can also um, affect the reduced parathyroid secretion, and that results in hypo, again, low calcium levels in the blood, and also hypophosphatemia, so low phosphate levels in the blood. Um, we will be touching on this a little bit more in relation to the bone health in the next session, so I won't say too much about that now.
Um, and some of the symptoms associated with this is paresthesia, so tingling, um, sensation in the fingers, muscle pain, cramps, convulsions, tetany, and also heart involvement. So what is the recommendations for hypothyroidism as well as hypoparathyroidism? And it is in relation to managing the cardiovascular disease risk um, in terms of the total cholesterol, which I said is raised um, for patients um, with hypothyroidism, um, as well as they have higher low density lipoprotein, which is the bad cholesterol, which we want to reduce. Um, there's raised triglycerides, we want to reduce that as well, and um, and obviously we want to reduce the um, the, homos the homocysteine levels that increases the cardiovascular risk for patients. So in terms of hypoparathyroidism, I know there's a lot of, it's quite a lot of information to take on board, but hopefully you can listen back to the recording again, just if there's something that's gone over your head um, whilst I was talking. Uh, but in terms of um, the hypoparathyroidism, it's important for you to um, monitor and maintain the phosphate and the calcium in normal range. And we saw in the previous slides that that can be low. Um, and also then to prevent or control system, symptoms that's in, that's related to that, which which I've highlighted in the previous slide. Um, so calcium supplementation is recommended, and and where that is um, sort of recommended, they, they do suggest to use the, the the calcium carbonate or citrate as as in that form, the supplementation in that form. Um, again, vitamin D levels to, to normalize that, and, and that will also help to normalize the calcium and the phosphate le um, levels. Again, in terms of vitamin D, um, I will do a more in-depth um, um, session in terms of vitamin D in, in context of bone health and immunity in the next session. So I've not done um, a, a lot around that in, in this particular session. But in terms of, um, you know, increasing the calcium in, in your diet um, in response to this reduced um, blood levels, so to have calcium, to uh, have a cal calcium-rich diet, so from natural sources uh, and your main sources, if you, if you take your mind back to the Eat Well Guide, the blue section is milk um, and milk alternatives, dairy products, but also fish. Um, particularly the bones, soft bones in, in the fish, um, vegetables, seeds such as chai seeds um, or fortified cereals. But just pay attention if you're taking fortified cereals, look out if it's also fortified with iron. If it is, then then don't go with that with that option. So then um, as you're increasing the calcium, the recommendation is then to reduce the, the intake because there's an inverse sort of relationship between calcium and phosphate. So then to limit the intake of phosphate-rich um, foods, um, such as eggs, meat, yogurt, beans, lentils, um, and also carbonated soft drinks. So quite a lot of, um, as you can see, a lot of nutritional sort of implications um, in relation to both hypothyroidism and hypoparathyroidism. So I mentioned to you that I will be speaking a little bit more about managing the cardiovascular risk um, because it, it's really important that that we do this because, you know, even just looking, even just thalassemia as is, you know, you you, you want to reduce almost the, the complications associated with the condition uh, on its own. And, and we know that the cardiovascular risk is increased because of this hormonal imbalance. But also if you have diabetes, um, you know, that can also sort of contribute to an increased cardiovascular risk. So we want to, to, to do all that we can to try and reduce that um, through, through the diet as much as we possibly can. So we mentioned um, in terms of cardiovascular risk, the um, reducing the total cholesterol um, in the diet um, and thinking about total cholesterol. So the foods that would predominantly increase the total cholesterol level, um, and that is um, the saturated fats, the amount of saturated fats that you that you take in your diet. Um, and so at the bottom there, I've, I've highlighted um, some of the foods that that will that contain saturated fats predominantly from animal products, um, but also ultra processed foods like pastries, pies, sausages, cakes, and biscuits. Um, 
again, if you if 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 to manage your cardiovascular risk, to reduce your cardiovascular risk, the recommendation is that you reduce your intake of these foods. So on the other hand, you want to increase your intake of healthier fats, so the mono unsaturated and the polyunsaturated fats. And their examples of that would be your olive oil, um, rapeseed oil, but in terms of um, omega-3 rich um, foods as well, so the oils that you get and the fat from there. So oily fish, so salmon, mackerel, sardines um, are good examples of your omega-3 sort of oily fish. Um, but you can also get plant um, sources of omega-3s as well. So walnuts, walnut oil, flaxseed, flaxseed oil, chai, um, soybean oil and canola um, oil. And again, this is particularly in, in, in regards to trying to reduce that total amount of cholesterol and particularly the LDL, the, the low density lipoprotein, uh, lipo, um, uh, um, protein, um, which is known as the, the bad cholesterol. So other things that you can do to try and reduce the total cholesterol level um, in, in, in the diet as well is by increasing your fiber intake. Um, so having foods like particularly oats, has been shown through research to actually have um, to reduce the cholesterol level in 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 the in the um, in the blood. Um, so porridge oats is a good a good option if 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 you if you're struggling um, with high cholesterol levels. But also um, fiber found in fruit, um, particularly the type of fiber there, soluble fiber, um, vegetables, pulses, and and legumes. Um, it's 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 important to also remember if you do you know, have um, low levels of hypo, um, hypothyroidism, but you also have pancreatic <laughs> insufficiency and you're on Creon, you know, the, I did say in previous slides that you're, you're not taking too much fiber because that can actually reduce the how well the enzymes um, work. So it, it's finding that happy balance um, so that you don't sort of so improve one area but then what another area suffers so just to be mindful of that as well in regards to reducing triglycerides um so foods that can increase the triglyceride in the blood uh, is particularly foods that contain a lot of sugar the added or the free sugars that i mentioned in previous slides um but also um the intake of um excessive intake of alcohol so, so you you know, if you are taking in more alcohol than that 14 units per week that I mentioned earlier, then it is um, advised that you try and reduce that and stay within within that recommendation, so that you can actually take positive action to reduce the the, the triglyceride level um, of of your blood, and therefore also help to reduce your overall cardiovascular risk. Um, also, in terms of total cholesterol, again, the weight. Um, maintaining a healthy weight. If you are a BMI of above 23, as I mentioned, um, then to take action um, to try and get, you know, lose lose weight. Um, and, and, and that can be in terms of, you know, making changes in terms of what you choose to eat in the diet, the types of food you're choosing, how much you're eating. Um, are you making, you know, choosing energy dense foods rather than foods that contain sort of what we call empty calories or just energy from sugar um, and to help that is engaging in regular activity as you are able. Um, the recommendation is that you engage in 30 minutes of activity five days a week. And again, working with your body, you know, if you are suffering because, you know, you're either fatigued or your anemia is not allowing you to do that, to find alternative ways to stay active. Uh, it could be chair-based activity that you do if you're not able to go on a walk or some planting or potting, potting, you know, just doing some sort of light kind of um, activity is recommended. And again, if you are smoking, then the recommendation is to to, to stop smoking because that that will definitely have a, a positive effect on uh, reducing the total cholesterol level. In terms of cholesterol as well, I don't, you know, there are um, compounds, plant-based compounds called stanols and sterols um, that has been shown to reduce the uh, blood cholesterol level. Um, and so I just uh, uh, thinking of um, uh, 
um, a product that you can buy in the supermarket, uh, a brand, um, so something like maybe a Benacol range or also Flora Proactive. Those products, they do contain these plant um, compounds called stanols and sterols, and they have been shown, as I said, to reduce the cholesterol level. So that may be something that to consider. Just to mention here as well um, that the British Dietetic Association, I know the UK Thalassemia um, Society, they have a website with information, but if you did want more information in terms of how to reduce your total cholesterol um, and you wanted more information on plant stanols and sterols, the British Dietetic Association, um, my professional association, they do do a, a wide range of um, what they call food fact sheets. So you could log on to onto that um, and 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 download you know the these um, leaflets as well to give you that extra bit of um, you know um, background and information to try and help reduce your cardiovascular risk. So the last uh, part of um, looking at the sort of hormonal imbalances is delayed puberty and hypogonadism and again looking at the clinical features um, it's mostly uh, and frequently encountered um, as a consequence of um, endocrine damage because of iron overload, but also um, it is related to the hypothalamic, the hypothalamus is a part of the brain, the pituitary gland is also part of the brain. So this hypothalamic pituitary gon gon gonadal axis, um, this is just for your information so that you can understand where this is coming from. You don't have to remember this. Um, it is prevalent um, in about 50% of adolescents. Um, so quite a high percentage of patients um, and relates to the lack of pubertal development in girls by the age of 13 and 14 in boys. Um, and associated with, with this delayed puberty um, for young people is, is psychological problems as well as emotional issues. Um, um, and also low self-esteem. So, you know, it is important to pay attention um, and support the young people through through this, this stage as well. So in terms of the treatment, um, it does depend on the age, um, the degree of iron overload, um, and also the damage um, to the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, and also if there is chronic liver disease because um, of iron overload. So specifically looking at hypogonadism, um, so early prevention is um, recommended um, and that is um, looking at correcting anemia by early blood transfusions or starting blood transfusions early in life um, to increase tissue oxidation, oxygenation, sorry. Um, but also to suppress the endogenous or the ineffective erythropoiesis and, 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 and erythroid expansion. So that is, um, you know, the extramedullary hematopoiesis that I mentioned way back uh, early on in the, in, in the uh, presentation. And this essentially leads to a hypermetabolic state. And what a hypermetabolic state means that it can have an impact on the metabolic rate. Um, and also in terms of the nutritional requirements for, for patients as well. So you do want to try and prevent this as much as possible, um, um, as, I, as I mentioned. And by not suppressing this, this process of the ineffective erythropoiesis and erythroid expansion, that can also place um, extra pressure on bone architecture leading to bone disease um, and also deformities which can affect growth. And as I said, we'll be touching specifically on bone um, growth um, at the next session. So what are some of the recommendations for hypogonadism um, in terms of the management? Um, so again, ensuring adequate cal um, calorie intake, um, monitoring the iron overload, we can't get away from that, ensuring adequate iron collation, um, you know, you would have heard of that <laughs> and continue to hear about that and, and other organ damage, ensuring, and this is really important, um, ensuring that families and patients have um, adequate support in terms of psychological support, social support, um, emotional support, but also that these growth discrepancies in relation to this um, is, is managed and detected early. Um, and, and, and so that's really important um, in, in relation to, you know, um, reducing the, the, the risk of hypogonadism. 
So what are some of the recommendations? Strict iron adherence to iron collation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and aiming to uh, achieve a serum ferritin level of less than 1,000 micrograms per litre, but also identifying and correcting the nutritional deficiencies in relation to zinc, vitamin D and selenium, correcting the endocrinopathies. So, you know, the slides that we've gone through in terms of pancreatic insufficiency and also prediabetes, diabetes, hypothyroidism. Um, timely induction of puberty, um, but also monitoring um, the early management of organ damage, especially to the heart and, and the liver. So we're coming close to the end of, 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 of this, this, sec this session, part two. So this is just some of the questions, again, that was asked in the first session in relation to endocrine problems. And so this person was saying, I need help with enzyme deficiency when on creone. And, and I did a, a slide on, on creone. So the creone is uh, to replace the enzymes that the pancreas is not able to release. And those enzymes, just to recap, is lipase, amylase, and protease, and the lipase to reduce to digest the fat, the protease to digest the protein, and the amylase to digest carbohydrates. So, so it's important that you take the creon regularly, take it as prescribed, take it with all meals and snacks. As I said, if you don't, then you, you're not going to have the, um, the enzymes there to digest the nutrients that you're taking in in your meals and your snacks, and that can lead to malabsorption, as I mentioned before, and also increase your malnutrition risk. Um, the advice is to take it with cold drinks, um, and also, as I mentioned before, reducing your intake of, of fiber-rich foods, alcohol as well, but also um, following a healthy, low-fat diet. So hopefully that answers your question um, in relation to creone. And then there was another question about losing weight um, with the imbalance of hormones associated with thalassemia. Um, and so, you know, we've just gone through the hypothyroidism and hypogonadism um, and also. Um, so in relation to that and knowing that hypothyroidism, the thyroid gland affects the metabolic rate, et cetera, and if it's not working um, effectively, that can have a, a knock-on effect, but essentially following a healthy, balanced diet. So when I say healthy, balanced diet, it's also paying attention to the energy balance. So how much you're taking in in the diet in terms of energy and how much you're losing. So if you know that you're not as active for various reasons, then obviously how much you're taking in you know, um, needs to match that or actually be less than that so that you can create an energy deficit that can help to facilitate the, the weight loss. As I've mentioned before in other slides, choosing healthier fat options, so going for more monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats and reducing the intake of your saturated fats that can also increase the cholesterol level. You want to take your uh, uh, increase your um, intake of lean protein sources, chicken, turkey, that sort of thing. Um, consider portion sizes. And again, you can use that plate, the example of the healthy food guide that I that I shared earlier on to help guide you in terms of um, sort of the types of food and, and the proportion, again, of, of foods that you, you know, for your plate. So limiting intake of high fat and sugary snacks. And again, if you know, if uh, you also have a, a, a tendency for prediabetes or at risk of prediabetes, or you already have diabetes, then that that is really important as well, because the high fat intake is going to add to your um, cardiovascular risk, which we want to reduce, and the high sugar intake is going to um, impact on your blood glucose control. So you want to manage that. Um, you want to engage in regular activity, as I've mentioned before, and again, it, it depending on where you are, you can, you know, you know what your ability is in terms of either walking or, you know, getting around and stuff like that. So, so match the activity for what you are able to do, uh, um, but but doing it on a regular basis um, and throughout the day if you're not able to do longer stints um, as recommended, um, and then. Compliance with iron collation, because we know that the hormone imbalances is in relation to your iron collation. So if you're not compliant or as compliant as you as you can be, then that is something to to consider as well. Um, so just 
there was a question around giving more information about minerals. So I've just done a brief sort of overview on zinc and selenium. As I mentioned before, we, I'm going to be doing a really sort of um, in more in-depth session on the key minerals um, and vitamins in the session, in session three, which is the 17th of April, so don't miss that. But in relation to the question, so just, just thinking about zinc, um, so it's not stored in the body, so we do need to take it in, you know, through the diet. Um, and good sources of zinc um, is meat. Um, if you eat meat, um, milk, cheese, eggs, shellfish, but there's also other sources like nuts and pulses, fortified breakfast cereals. And again, I'll just say with the fortified breakfast cereals, just check if it includes iron, then, you know, not to have that. Baked beans, uh, chickpeas. Um, in terms of zinc, so getting your medical team to check your baseline levels if you don't know what your baseline levels are and then correcting, you know, if there is a deficiency, which for most patients from looking at the literature, zinc deficiency is very common um, within uh, thalassemic, uh, thalassemic patients, um, both transfusion and non-transfusion dependent. Um, so you want to correct that with supplements, but once it's corrected, then you want to maintain that by um, through your diet. Um, again, in terms of extra information and extra sources, the BDA, as I mentioned, um, they do have food fact sheets on both zinc and selenium and a range of other minerals as well. So if you do want to have more information, then you can log on to um, the, that website um, and, and, and download uh, those resources because they're free. Um, so coming on to selenium. So again, it's important in terms of following a healthy diet um, and good sources of selenium. Um, Brazil nuts. So, um, you know, if you have uh, Brazil nuts every day, up to five to seven, I love Brazil nuts, up to five to seven Brazil nuts a day can actually meet your selenium requirements. And for children, um, up to four to six um, th that can actually also meet the selenium um, requirements, but also other foods such as um, oysters, if you eat oysters, tuna, eggs, sardine, sunflower seeds, mushrooms, they're also identified as good sources of selenium. Um, when it comes to the plant-based sources, um, it does depend on the quality of the soil. So depending on where, where you where you, um, you you get the, those um, um, supplies from, but also beware of toxicity as well in the context of selenium. And again, as I mentioned, um, the BDA has resources, uh, food fact sheets. And if you wanted more information on that, you can download um, those um, resources as well. I think that the last of the questions um, that came through um, from session one. Um, and I think, yeah, that concludes sort of part two. So again, I hope you found that helpful. Um, you've made notes um, as you were going along, but again, it's being recorded, so you can always go back and listen. So now we come to the last part of um, this evening's session, and it's about lifestyle and empowerment. And it's just helpful tips, uh, you know, that you can do to try and improve your overall health and well-being, dealing with, um, you know, your your chronic um, condition. So I've mentioned some of these stuff in session one, and I will be mentioning this in all the sessions because we all need, you know, uh, reminding and sort of, you know, about the importance of, and you've heard throughout the presentation about the lifestyle uh, um, changes. Um, and, and, and so it's important, you know, that you do pay attention to taking action in terms of improving lifestyle practices in relation to improving your overall quality of life. And again, self-care, the definition is anything that you do that improves your quality of life. It could be sleep, you know, it could be um, just having a break. It could be having a relaxation, maybe having a massage, you know, um, so whatever it is for you, but it's important that that you pay attention to to doing something in terms of self care um, to improve your quality of life. Um, and then I want to challenge you to to think about one activity or one goal that you want to work towards in terms of your diet. Um, there was a lot that was spoken about this evening on on the call. Lots of um, risk. Lots of 
changes to the diet, things that you need to, to do in, to, in terms of reducing your cardiovascular risk, in terms of improving your glu blood glucose control. So think about maybe one or two things that if, you, if you're if not already doing it, and I've mentioned, I've asked or recommended for you to do it, think about what you can do. I've listed there maybe, you know, if you're not quite up to the five a day, maybe thinking that that might be something that you can work towards. Um, you know, it, it, and maybe choosing healthier fats. If you do like to have more saturated fats in your diet, um, but you've learned now that there's an increased cardiovascular risk, so maybe thinking about what you can reduce or maybe cut out or what you can swap with a healthier fat option, for example. Um, also thinking about your carbohydrates. You know, I had that slide about the different types of carbohydrates. If you are having more of the fourth group, which is the, the free um, sugars, which we know can have a negative impact on your blood glucose control, maybe thinking about what you can do to try and reduce that um, from your diet so that, you know, you, you don't unnecessarily, um, you know, increase your your risk of developing complications associated with, with long-term sort of um, poor glycemic control. So there's lots of things. These are just examples that I've mentioned uh, in terms of diet. But in terms of lifestyle, I've mentioned a couple of times smoking as something to 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 um to stop to cut out alcohol was one of the things as well um so again thinking about what one thing in terms of your lifestyle that you can do in relation to what you've heard tonight um and um and i want to challenge you and i want to hear about it next time that that, that we speak so in terms of quality of life again it, you know, you, you're living with this condition, so it's a daily sort of choice in terms of what you do and the practice that, that you choose to, to, to do, you know, in terms of improving um, your quality of life um, in relation to managing your, your condition. So it is important that you do try to take positive action as much as possible um, in relation to improving your quality of life and overall health and well-being. Be proactive, you know, don't wait. Sometimes you know, just take take that initiative. You've heard a lot of things today. If you're not already doing it, just be proactive and decide that you're going to be doing something um, that was suggested or recommended or maybe ask your team, you know, if, if you're not already doing it um, for some support and, and help with that. Um, setting a goal. So it's so important. I, I love setting goals. I do have I do like a to do list because <laughs> it does help me to focus, uh, you know, on what I'm doing. Um, so my challenge is um, that I want each one of you on the call and when you're listening the, to the recording to set a, a goal um, and maybe share it in the chat you know, before we end. Um, and, you know, I will get a list of everything that happens in the chat. So I will look through and hopefully I can share some of your goals, um, you know, when we talk again. Um, but, you know, you've heard about the importance of support, support networks. So maintain good relationships, you know, don't almost suffer in silence or alone um, do ask for help if if if, if you need it um, but having good relationships good connections in terms of family in terms of friends but also in terms of your 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 health team um, is is also very important um, and so yeah so these are just some things that that you can do um, you know in terms of improving your lifestyle practices and also in terms of empowering you because the reality is that you know you live with the condition um, and you know I have a long-term condition as well that I that I li live with and so I I have a daily choice you know as to how I manage that um, and so you know it's not easy uh, and it's and it's good to have um, good support networks, um, people that can encourage you, um, and you know just 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 be there for you if 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 you need to. So ask for help. So this is the last slide, and it's about what one takeaway do you take from this full session? It's been. A, you know, a full session, we've spoken about quite a lot of things and um, 
but I, I, I want to ask, you know, may, maybe again share it in, in the chat if there's one thing, one or two things, um, just share it in the chat. I'd, I'd love to know what you take away. Um, feedback, good or bad, you know, feedback is good. Uh, I was told feedback is love, so I'll take it in that context. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, what one takeaway do you take away from today's session? Um, maybe share it in the chat. And again, as I said, I will get that information um and um and you know yeah so that's sort of the the end of the presentation it, it's full i i'm i don't know about you i'm exhausted but i really enjoyed it thank you so much for listening i couldn't see who was coming and going but hopefully you all stay till the end um and again just thanking the red cell network and the uk thalassemia society um i didn't get to to share my favorite uh, quote so I want to share that with you because we've got a few minutes for me to share that. And so essentially, um, the quote is by Ralph Waldo Emerson, and it is, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. Um, and so this this was my, let's say, my, my um, quote that, that basically journeyed with me as I was going through my doctorate because there was not a lot of help and support moving forward. But I'm grateful on this side that, you know, with the work that I have been able to do um, already and moving forward, that I am building a, a path and hopefully leaving a trail. And so I want to challenge you. What trail are you leaving? What path are you forging in terms of, you know, your health and your well-being and, and, and so forth? Um, and um, yeah, just food for thought. But thank you so much um, for your attention and, and for listening. I look forward to seeing you uh, on the next session which is the 17th of april um and as i said please put the 5th of may or the 1st of may in your diary and hopefully you know we, we will speak then as well thank you so much